In this video, we're going to look at existential instantiation and existential generalization. These are two rules of inference for predicate logic. Existential instantiation lets us go from an existential statement to a particular statement. And existential generalization lets us go from a particular statement to an existential statement. In this video, we're going to be learning what an existential statement is and how it differs from a particular statement. And we'll also learn a restriction on one of these rules. You are currently watching For the Love of Wisdom, my YouTube channel on free thought, philosophy, and critical thinking. This video is part of a series of videos on symbolic logic. In the past two videos, we started learning about predicate logic and we looked at the rules of universal instantiation and universal generalization. These are the two universal counterparts to the existential rules we'll be learning about in this video. And in the previous videos, we learned about sentential logic, which focuses on the logical relationships between sentences while leaving the contents of the sentence a black box, something that is unknown. So if you are not already familiar with sentential logic, you may want to pause here and go look at one of these other videos. There should be links to the videos from this spot in the video, and they'll open up in a new window, and when you're finished, you can come back to this video. So let's look at this argument. It says, no dogs are skunks, some dogs are pets, therefore, some pets are not skunks. This is a valid argument. It cannot be proven with just sentential logic, though. We need to be able to symbolize what each premise and the conclusion is saying. So let's look at what these are saying. Uh, no dogs are skunks. That is a universal statement. We learned about those in the previous video, but it differs from the ones we already learned about in that this one is negative. While the others were talking about how one category is fits wholly within another category. This is talking about how two categories are mutually exclusive of each other, saying dogs and skunks are mutually exclusive. Our next premise says some dogs are pets. This is saying that something exists. It's an existential statement. And it's saying there's an intersection between two categories, these being dogs and pets. So in a way, it's the opposite of this kind of statement. This is saying two categories are mutually exclusive. This is saying there's an intersection between them. And then here we have a statement that says some pets are not skunks. This is an existential statement as well, but it's a negative existential statement. And it's saying that the category of pets there's something in the category of pets that is outside of the category of skunks. And notice that this is the opposite of saying all pets are skunks. It's saying some pets are not skunks. So it's contradicting all pets are skunks. And if this said, say, some, skunk, some dogs are skunks, it would be contradicting no dogs are skunks. So these two kinds contradict each other, and this contradicts the kind of universal statement we learned about in the previous video. But we won't actually be using that information here. But it's something to know about. Now to symbolize this argument, we're going to need a new symbol. That is the existential quantifier. It's written as a backwards E, and it means there exists. It can be written in HTML as ampersand exist semicolon. And here's how we would symbolize the argument that we just looked at. Uh, for every x, if x is a dog, then x is not a skunk. And then we have there exists an x such that x is a dog and x is a pet. Even though some dogs are pets is written with a plural for dogs and pets. When we symbolize it logically, all we're asserting is that there is at least one thing that is both. 
And that's what the existential quantifier means. It means there is ex there is at least one thing that has this property and this property. And then our conclusion is there is at least one thing. There is there exists an X such that X is a pet and X is not a skunk. So how are we going to prove the validity of this argument? We're going to need a couple new rules. One of these is going to allow us to go from our existential premises to uh, particular premises, which we can use sentential logic on. And then we're going to need another rule to go back to an existential conclusion. And these are, of course, existential instantiation and existential generalization. So let's take a look at how this argument works. We have our premises here and our conclusion that we want to prove. So first of all, we're going to use the rule of existential instantiation to get DA and PA on line three. And then on line four, we use the rule of universal instantiation to get if DA, then not SA. Now you might be wondering, could we have done this in the opposite order? Could we have used universal instantiation first and then done existential instantiation? If we had done that, we would not be able to use the same name. Uh, we might instantiate universe, we might instantiate line one to if DA then not SA, but if we did that, the name A would no longer be available to use with existential instantiation. There is a restriction on the rule of existential instantiation, and that is whenever we use it, we have to use it to a new name. And the reason for this is that when we have a claim of existence about something, it's not telling us who exists. It's just saying there is something of this description which exists. And when we use existential identification, instantiation, we are giving that thing or person or whatever it is that exists an arbitrary name by which we will refer to it. And that name just refers to something that the existential statement is telling us exists. It cannot be a particular individual. So we have to do existential instantiation before we do universal instantiation if we were to use the same name, the same subject for uh, what we instantiate each of them to. So we start out with existential instantiation. We instantiate to the name A. And as we do this, we replace every instance of the variable that is bound to the quantifier with uh, the same uh, name. And we do that for both existential instantiation and for universal instantiation. Okay, now that we have these two premises, we can use simplification on line three to get DA. And we're doing that because we need DA uh, for a modus ponens so we can get not SA from line four. So now that we have DA, we use modus ponens on four and five and we get not SA. And if you look up at the conclusion, we want to get PA and not SA, which we'll then be able to use with an existential generalization to get our conclusion. So we also want to get PA, and that's also in three. So we use simplification again to get PA on line seven. And now that we have PA and not SA on separate lines, we can join them together on line eight, and we get PA and not SA. And then on line nine, we can use existential generalization to get there exists an X such that PX and not SX. And there is no uh, restriction on the use of existential generalization. You just have to remember that when you use it, uh, whatever name you turn into a bound variable, you have to replace every instance of that name. So here we have two instances of A, and so we have to replace both of those with X, which we're binding to the existential quantifier. If we changed it to something like there exists an X such that PA and not SX, that would be wrong. We couldn't do that. We have to change all of them. Okay, now let me show you another example 
of the restriction on existential instantiation just to uh, show more clearly why we have this restriction. So consider the argument. Holly is a cat. Here she is. And dogs exist. Therefore, something is both a dog and a cat. Without this restriction on existential instantiation, we could prove that something is both a dog and a cat, but that would be invalid. So we begin with the first premise, Holly is a cat. And our second premise is, there is something that is a dog. And so on line three, we wrongly use existential instantiation to get Holly is a dog. And then on line four, we through conjunction, we get Holly is a dog and Holly is a cat. And then through existential generalization, we get there is something that is both a dog and a cat. Well, this is a very bad argument. And the problem is not with the existential generalization. The problem is with the existential instantiation. Because we already have Holly as a known individual, it's invalid to go from this existential statement to a statement about Holly. When we have an existential statement, we don't know who it refers to. It could refer to Holly, it might not refer to Holly. And in the case that it might not, it would be wrong to uh, instantiate it to her. And for any individual, it could be the case that it would be wrong to instantiate it to that individual. So it's an invalid move to go from an existential statement to a, to a particular statement about a known individual who is already mentioned in our argument. So we've just learned about existential instantiation and existential generalization. Uh, there's a restriction on the rule of existential instantiation. Uh, whenever we go from an existential statement to a particular statement, the name that we, we replace the bound variable with must be a new name that has not appeared in any prior premise and has not appeared in the conclusion. But with existential generalization, when we go from a particular statement to an existential statement, there are no restrictions on that. So you have been watching, for the love of wisdom, my YouTube channel on free thought, philosophy, and critical thinking. And if you've liked this video, uh, please favorite it or share it or like it down below. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can subscribe to For the Love of Wisdom. That's all one word. And there is a button for that right up here. The next video in this series should be about categorical syllogisms. And I have the thumbnail for it up right now. But until I actually make the video and put it on YouTube, this is not going to link to anything. But once it is there, this will be linking to the new video in the series. And besides making videos on logic, I also make them on other subjects. Uh, here's an example. I've made one video on the question, would aliens look like us? And specifically, I was talking about aliens who are capable of visiting Earth. Um, would they look like us? And in this video, I'm examining chapter two of Bertrand Russell's book, The Conquest of Happiness. That chapter is called Byronic Unhappiness. And this is the idea that wisdom can cause unhappiness, that if you know enough about the world, you can't help but be unhappy about things. And Russell uh, criticizes this point of view. And I present what he's saying in this video.